So uh, ETLing the Israeli government, who knows what ETLing means? Who doesn't know? Okay, so ETL is basically the fancy name for taking data, transforming it, and then putting it somewhere else. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, extract, transform, and load. Um, so that's the title. Okay, so about me, um, I spent about ten years of my life in the business of, in the business of super secret data, especially taking it from people who don't want to share it. Um, now I've been about 10 years working with open data, um, sharing data to the world, so uh, I guess it's karma. Um, I'm the co-founder of the Public Knowledge Workshop, Sadna uh, Ledetsibui. I've been the lead engineer of Open Knowledge International, which is like the Sadna, but uh, on a global scale. Also the author of the Fiscal Data Package Specification, um, and that's enough about me. And in the Public Knowledge Workshop, I've been working mostly on a project called the Budget Key. It's been running for about eight years. Um, and it collects data from the Israeli government, only uh, public data, not uh, secret data, uh, about budgeting, how the uh, government creates, decides the, about, the, is, about the national budget, how it modifies it, how it spends the data, that is, uh, how it gives the the sorry, how it spends the money, how it gives money to associations, to companies, to people, uh, to municipalities, and how that money sort of flows. Um, and about the recipients, who gets the money, um, how these people or organizations are connected to one another or to officials in the government. And after all these years, we currently have uh, the most comprehensive database about money and about government money uh, uh, in the world, especially in Israel. Um, and I'll show you why in a second. And you can find all about it in nextobudget.org. So this is about the project really in, in a nutshell. Now, the main problem we have in the project is getting the data. And when we get the data, we, we work with about 30 different government agencies and each one of these government agencies has multiple data sets that we're getting. So, for example, we have uh, uh, Agaftak Tzivim, which gives us the uh, information about the budget, about uh, maybe political deals around the budget, about budget changes. We got, we got Agafa Khashav Klali, which is the general accountant, which uh, gives us the data about how budget is being spent, or some of the data. We have uh, uh, government procurement, which gives us data about tenders. When I say gives, not exactly gives, uh, but publishes data. We have Ministry of Economy and Industry, which uh, has da da data about uh, different companies. We have a Ministry of Education, we have uh, Israel Corporation Authority, which has different registrars for companies, for associations, for um, uh, Othman associations, which is like a crazy thing that's uh, been around for uh, hundreds of years in Israel. And also it has a registrar for uh, things that don't have a registrar. Blows your mind. Bank of Israel, data about the economy. We have the Central Bureau of Statistics, and this is only the tip of the iceberg. So we're getting data from really lots of different sources. And the thing about these data sets is what we call it's, it's medium data. Um, it's not big data. We don't, I mean, the, the largest data set has a million rows. I mean, we wouldn't call it big data. It's, it fits on your laptop, all of it. Um, but Excel wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily open it. So it's somewhere between Excel and Hadoop, somewhere in the middle. It's sort of uncharted ground because um, usually you're used to work with small data or very big data. Um, and this medium data is, is sort of a, a, an area that it's a, a bit hard to work with. Um, if you take a look at uh, the spending data, that is uh, all the, all the, everything that the government buys, it's spread around uh, among 400 different Excel files. In total, it's about a million rows, um, but it's very hard to work with for normal people, not ones in this room, obviously. Um, okay, so what do we do with it? I mean, it's not just about, okay, let's take all the data sets and put them somewhere else. We want to join them, we want to fuse them, and we want to create context and insights out of them. Um, so just a few examples um, of what we can do with it. It's really uh, a few examples. So. For example, when the government is giving some money to an association, um, where exactly is that association operating in Israel? I mean, 
we want to maybe do an analysis on how that money is, is being spread across the, across Israel. Is it going more to the uh, Tel Aviv or more to Sderot uh, or more to, uh, uh, I don't know, Kiyat Shmona? Um, when budget is being moved from one place to another, is it related to some coalition deal? I mean, the, the context is super interesting here. Um, when the state signs a construction contract, so let's say uh, the government wants, wants to build a building, um, does that construction firm has any uh, safety violations? So by combining data from multiple sources into one place, and currently we have all those data sets in one SQL database, which um, which is amazing compared to the government where agencies simply don't talk to each other and just combining two data sets is like a five-year project with two million uh, shekels uh, budget. So by combining all these data sets together, we can give lots of context to, to people. Uh, we have a website which sort of uh, gives away, gives, gives out these, these data to, 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 to users of the website, but we also work a lot with the media and they're really interested. They have lots of questions and we can very easily have uh, answers about uh, um, how, they, how money is being spent ge geographically or per citizen or whatever. So there's a lot, of, lot, lot to be have, had from, from combining all these, these data sets together. Uh, even the, the most basic thing, entity resolution. There are lots of data sets that say, okay, we gave money to this, this company. This company, we have the name. But we do, I mean, the name is not enough because the name can be written in, in five different ways. Um, we want to know exactly who that, who that company is. And in Israel, we have like a unique number for each company, but that unique number is not always published. So just going to the, all the registrar of all the, all the entities, companies, association, municipalities, government offices, whatever, and combining them and creating a list of all the names with all the uh, uh, unique IDs is something that doesn't exist anywhere but in our database. Um, so this is a this is basically our problem, what we're trying to do. But we have a, a very unique constraint as well, and and our most uh, difficult constraint is basically that we're based on volunteers. We don't have uh, the luxury of uh, a lot big budgets and employees. Uh, we're we're really based on people coming every week or once a week or, or just once, hack for two or three hours, and they want to do something. And after three hours, they're gone, maybe forever. Uh, maybe for uh, a month. So, when in all tools, and especially in the ETL tools, we're really um, focused on, on tools that are very easily installable. It, this should be, it should be portable, uh, no complex setup. Uh, it shouldn't be, uh, you know what, you need to have that specific uh, version of, of, uh, of Ubuntu installed on your uh, uh, Intel CPU because otherwise it wouldn't work. Or you need to have three machines or an AWS account. Uh, it should be maintainable. Uh, that is, people coming with almost no uh, uh, training should leave code that is readable and it's with our style guide. So uh, it should be really maintainable. Uh, we shouldn't give those people uh, um, lots of boilerplate to do. And it should be a low, low footprint. I mean, you, we don't want to ask people, you know what, can you uh, allocate a 250 gigabyte uh, partition in your hard drive and remove all Python installations because you need to hack for two hours. So we have very hard constraints because we're based on volunteers. Um, and this is why we got to the conclusion that we need a new ATL uh, for, for doing what we're doing. Uh, we took a hard look on, 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 on existing ETL solutions. We took a look at Airflow and Luigi and, and other solutions. And these are industry standard solutions. That is, they're meant for people that come to a startup or to a, uh, uh, to a company that have a two week uh, uh, onboarding. You install it and then it just works and it's a power horse. Um, it does whatever you want. It's super flexible, super powerful. Um, but it's not for installing in 15 minutes and, and writing some, some pipeline. It's, it's not for that. It's for uh, doing really heavy lifting. Um, they're, they're, they're optimized in a different working, um, working point. If you see the, that image, they really optimize that. We have a few sources, and then we want to run 100,000 tasks, processing tasks, on, on, on those few sources. Whereas our working point is really different. We have very uh, a lot of, of sources, but we have shallow processing. We don't have like very hard machine learning stuff on it. We want to just join a few data sets and, and create uh, um, better data sets, basically. So, so the working point is really different. We want to be able to run all these on a, on a, on a very simple laptop. I mean, we don't, we, we don't have, we don't want to have any, any hardware requirements for, from volunteers. 
So we decided to write a new ETL. And, and while we're writing it, we also said, okay, we also want the ETL to be open uh, uh, by nature or natively open. What does it mean? It means that every single uh, artifact that the ETL produces um, will be open. Will be, and and, and what, what does it mean that it's open? It's not just open source. It means the data is open. And when I say open data, I mean uh, that the uh, CSV files that are generated are well documented and that it's easily usable and reusable by other people, not just by us. Um, there was a talk earlier today about tidy data, so the data should be tidy. Um, and, and here we're using a, a standard called data packages, which is basically a, a really cool way of getting data that is in a CSV file, but documenting it, and documenting it in a way that makes it really reusable in, in various platforms and various uh, languages. Um, you can read more about it in frictionsdata.io. Um, let me read the quote, because it's really a good quote. Um, data package is a simple container format used to describe and package a collection of data. Format provides a simple contact contract for data interoperability that supports frictionless delivery, installation, and management of data. You can say that someone that really speaks good English wrote it. Um, so let me show you how it works. So we're publishing all our uh, data sets in a place called Data Hub.io, which uh, I also work on uh, that website as well. Um, so it looks like this. I mean, you have the website and it, you have a list of data sets. And each one of these data sets is basically a CSV file or a list of CSV files and a file called Data Package JSON, which is um, the metadata and the documentation of what is in the, those CSV files, basically the schema. And the way that it works is obviously you can download the CSV file and open in them in any CSV compliant software, but you can also use the data package Python library. And I'll do a live demo now, imagine me typing. Um, so I'm, I'm importing a um, data package from, I'm importing a, 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 an object called package from the data package library. I'm open, uh, opening this data package JSON. I'm just passing a URL to the, to the package. Now I can see that it has one resource. Um, it could contain multiple, but this has only one resource, and I can iterate on that resource. So I'm just taking that first resource. I'm calling uh, iter, which basically generates an iterator. I can iterate on, on dicts, on, on lists, uh, depending on how I like it. Um, I happen to like uh, dicts. Um, and I'm just printing the first uh, value in that iterator. And what I got is just an object. And the cool thing about this object is that I don't need to worry about data types. I'm getting here uh, daytime, I'm getting de decimals if it's a number. I mean, even getting here um, uh, objects, JSON objects. And it's all in the CSV file. So if you want to parse it yourself, you can. If you want to pass it to another, uh, uh, um, to anything else, you can. But using this is, is really very useful. And every output of the pipeline, every intermediate file is, is, is a data package. So it can be re reused in other pipelines, and it can be used by other people as well. Um, so that's very useful. Um, so the ETL library we wrote is called Data Package Pipelines. So it has data package in the name, meaning it's uh, pipelines of data packages. Um, and it's built on, on three pillars. First of all, um, it's really uh, um, the, the, the basic idea is that you write the pipelines, you try to write it in not in code, but in configuration. So you write your pipelines in configuration, you use sort of building blocks, common building blocks that we defined. Um, and I explain why, why we do this uh, crazy thing. Second of all, input and output works through streaming data. So it's, you don't load a data file, you process it and you just write it, but you try to process it uh, row by row. And lastly, it's built natively on, on data packages, which I think it's uh, understandable by, by now. So wh why work with a, a declarative and not in code? Um, so th the, way we cho the, the reason we chose to use declarative uh, uh, pipelines is because when, we use, when you go declarative, it means you have a, a very st stricter structure to the pipeline. It's not like you give someone uh, um, an ID and tell them, you know, write whatever you want. Uh, they need to follow a specific structure. That structure can be validated. And since everyone is using the same building blocks, even someone if, if someone is coming for two hours and writing a pipeline, the next person reading that same structure will 
automatically understand because it's using the same language. So Python is very flexible. We, tr we try to reduce that flexibility into something that's more structured. It's more maintainable, it's more readable, it's understandable by others. Um, and it's, this limited flexibility also allows us to uh, uh, make sure, for example, that no one is, uh, for example, loading a gigabyte file into memory and, and crashing our servers because everything is, is working uh, streaming and I'll talk about it now. Because everything is working streaming, then um, it's is easier on, on the CPU and RAM. It's, it, fa it fails fast, and, and this animation will uh, exemplify that uh, in a second. And this also means if it fails fast, it means you don't need to have uh, uh, lots of processing just to find out that something fails. Um, <coughs> Technical bit now. So how it works, each one of these the steps in a pipeline gets its own Python process. This way we can uh, uh, use better the, the, all, the, all the cores in the, in the machine. And, each, um, and these processes uh, communicate through STD in and STD out. So let's say one row of data comes to the first process, it's get, it gets processed in that process, then it gets outputted and moved to the second process, etc., etc. The same way this leaf on this animation goes from pool to pool, okay, and if there is an error in the last pool, let's say a leakage of water, we find out about it really quickly, we don't need all the leaves to go from the first pool to the second pool, only to find out that there's a problem in the last pool. So we're working streaming, it means also we don't need to load lots of data into memory, which is great. Um, and it, the fact that we use STD and STD out also makes it really easy to execute one of the steps in a pipeline on a remote server, and we often need to do that because government tends to block IPs which are not from Israel, so we run all our, all our infrastructure on Google Cloud, for example, but specifically we have one server that does the actual scraping uh, that is in Israel, uh, otherwise we get, just get blocked. So this is a, a really a nice feature with that we allows us to run most of, most of the things in, in a normal cloud and then uh, some of the things in, in Israel. Okay, so, so what, what are the standard building blocks that, that we're using? Um, so what we found out is that, okay, you write uh, a, a pipeline, a scraper, you work with a specific uh, source. So every, every, each one of those sources is like a unique uh, snowflake, obviously, but 90% um, of the code is usually the same. I mean, usually you... Uh, um, you get the data and then you start uh, um, tidying it, modifying the, the headers, you set data types, you modify a bit the types, uh, maybe you parse a bit the, the dates, um, maybe you start joining with other data sets. So all of this stuff is, is pretty uh, standard and um, we, we built a few building blocks that are really uh, useful and, and common to use so that what you actually need to write is that specific bit that is specific for your specific problem, which is, might be, uh, I don't know, fixing a CSV format from a specific uh, um, source in the government that thought that, yes, yeah, CSV is just comma-separated values and didn't take into account, I don't know, uh, quotes or new lines in the data and stuff like that. So, which are the standard building blocks? So, first of all, we have load. Loads data from local file, remote file, uh, SQL database, load some data. Then we have uh, uh, building blocks which basically set types, and it doesn't only set data types. Uh, it set, when we set types, we can also do some basic parsing of data, so we can parse dates, for example. We can also set constraints, so if we have a year uh, a column, we can say, okay, this is an integer, but it has to be larger than, let's say, 1900 and smaller than uh, uh, 2100, otherwise it's, it's invalid data. So it allows us to validate the data while we're processing it. Uh, then concatenate. We have sometimes data set that have one file per year. We want, I mean, this is completely useless. We want to have one file that contains all the data for all the years, so we concatenate all the files. Um, we have a join, um, a join processor which just takes two data sets and joins them, creates one enhanced data set. Um, uh, a very simple example, we have the data set that has transactions with the name of the company, and then we have that other data set that matches the na name of the company with, the, uh, with its ID. So when we join them, basically we get one data set that has transaction, name of the company, and its ID. 
Um, we have sort, which basically um, sorts. Um, you can ask how do we sort with the streaming data? Well, we don't do it streaming, obviously. We store uh, um, the data in the disk and then we, we sort it there. Um, but by giving the users the sort, we don't uh, occasionally run into the developer that thinks, okay, let's just run sorted on, on, a, on an iterator and then uh, let's see what happens. And what happens is the old memory runs out. So this never happens because we already have that and it's already built so it doesn't use a lot of memory. Um, filter basically filters out rows or chooses rows not to add. And finally, we have a dump which takes all that, all that data set and it just dumps it to whatever place we want. Uh, we can store it in a zip file or just a regular file or on S3, on database, on Elasticsearch. Uh, or on data hub so and we can have multiple uh, targets as well so uh, these are the standard building blocks and what about the rest so the rest is pretty uh, pretty easy we have obviously a lot, a lot of building blocks that I didn't didn't mention we have unpivoting uh, we have adding computed fields so for example we we want to add just a common column to all the to all the data we can do that uh, find replace duplicate stream so a lot of, of very basic operations already are already there, and um, so so this leaves the developer uh, really a, a small place where they actually need to write code, and the less code that they need to write, it means more people can contribute. And when working with volunteers, this is again very important to us to broaden the the, the circle of people that can actually contribute. We don't want to um, to set a very high bar and then lose lots of the people. Um, custom processing. So if you want to write a processor, you can obviously do that. So for, for example, this one just adds a timestamp to all the rows. So we don't have a, a building block that does it, but it's very easy to, um, to add a timestamp to, to a specific row. And, and, and the beauty of it is that we don't, I don't want to need to worry about anything else. I don't need to worry about loading the data or storing it. I just need to do the uh, line by line processing. Um, and just add it to the pipeline, and the pipeline could be 95% based on, on standard blocks and just this custom processing because I need it for my specific uh, pipeline. Okay, so this is the last slide, and then you can ask questions, and then you can go and get coffee. I need some, I see some people already um, lost the battle. Um, so I'd, I'd like to invite you all, uh, come and hack with us with the Public Knowledge Workshop. We meet uh, every Monday in Google campus, which is really nice. It has nice views of uh, Ayalon. Um, it has some food and coffee and other, um, more food. Uh, we meet uh, at 7 p.m. and there's lots of great projects, including mine, but not only. Um, and we work a lot in Python. We'll just also do front-end for those here who like to experiment. Um, and that's it. Any questions? So uh, the question is, was uh, um, how much time does it take for a volunteer to, 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 to onboard? Um, and this is actually something that we put a lot of, lots of effort on and we actually measure ourselves by how much time does it take someone, to, someone that's completely brand new to actually commit, fulfill the, their first uh, commit and, and get their code running. We call it uh, the toffee metric, uh, time of fixing a bug end to end. Um, you, you can look it up. Um, but basically, uh, there's a lot of people that within the hour, they learn the, the, they learn the thing, they read all the readmes because we have great readmes, and they write the first pipeline, which is just a demo pipeline, but they, they write the first pipeline, and then they get assigned an actual task, which might take them a, a, bit, a bit longer, but we measure it by hours. I mean, we don't have the, the two-week onboarding that most companies have. Yeah, the, the, the question is how much power does it take to, to, to use and do we, do we need the GPUs and stuff? Um, so again, since we, we I mean, the, our use case is a bit, it's not, we're not, our use case is unique. So we don't, the, the data sets don't change that often. I mean, they change maybe once a day. Uh, that's like the, the most uh, uh, frequent ones. Uh, national budget change, changes once a year. So we don't really care about how long it takes. If it takes a day to finish all the processing of all the data, then that's fine. Um, if it takes a few minutes more, then that's fine. I mean, that's not our, our optimization point. Um, so, we, so we don't really care. I mean, uh, 
Yeah, th this project was uh, Data Package Pipeline, so it was initially developed uh, uh, in Open Knowledge International, and uh, uh, the budget key was its main uh, uh, design partner, I would say, because I was the person that doing both. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's now used also in, in Baited Food Sorts, so it's, so it's gaining some, uh, some traction. Can you talk about data overlaps and uh, what uh, maybe data that you're missing currently from the government? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lo lots of data that's missing from the government. Um, so, so th there's... Uh, there's data that's not being published. That's like the good thing. That's that's a good thing because we know that's not being published. That's data that's being published but not in full, and we don't know what's missing. Um, so, for example, when we talk, you talk about government contracts. Uh, some contracts are not being published because they're sensitive, and you don't know that they, they they're not being published. And there's lots of data that's just uh, very messy, uh, bad data. Um, there are systems that, for, for example, you, you see a contract that the sum, I mean, the, 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 the sum of the contract is, was written uh, in mis by mistake uh, uh, using the ID of the company. So instead of, uh, or, or three, three zeros were added by mistake. So you find, let's say, buying sandwiches instead of three million shekels, you find three billion shekels. Or instead of uh, uh, 3,000 shekels, you find the, the name, the ID of the company, which is, I don't know. 52 something 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 so so data is messy and and some of the things we do is also clean them in, and improve them so when we publish the data sets we, for example we look in the sum if it's uh, if it if it verifies as a, as a as, a, as an idea of a company if it's if it verifies as an idea of the company we just throw that row because it, it's it's bad data and we also work a lot of with with the government themselves to publish better so we're not just passively getting data we're working a lot with government officials and uh, trying to uh, explain and, and get them to publish data better and, and we're succeeding. I mean, they're really improving over time. So uh, it's not like dark versus light. It's really a combination. Yeah, in the back. Would you say that the majority of your work is uh, getting new data sources and integrating them or like just working like a... Uh because it seems like most of the uh, type of issues that is all about getting new sources of data. So um, I would say my, the majority of uh, of my work uh, is um, is actually getting the, the the current data and improving it and working on it. Um, the new sources is usually the, the task that I give to new volunteers. Um, because usually the data that we don't have is usually the data that's less important to us. To us. So uh, new volunteers get the new sources, and once they integrate it, then we we start using it and, and getting generating insights from it. Then we then it comes to me basically. Where can you see the data? So the data you can see it first of all on nextobudget.org. This is the website. We have a, a readash instance where you can access all the data um, in SQL form. So you can just query any any data that we have in readash. Um, it's app.readash.io slash hasadna. And uh, all the data is also available as data packages in datahub.io slash budget key. Um, you can download it uh, in raw form. And we also have an API, yet, but that's less important. The, the question was, do we constantly uh, run the pipelines, run the pipelines and stream the data over and over again? So yes, for example, we... Um, we get data about companies. Companies are being added all the time. Every time we get new companies, we want to rerun the matching of entities to see if we miss something. So um, yeah, so pipelines are getting rerun all the time uh, based on what's changed. So if, for example, uh, the, the the list of entities changed, then we want to do re rerun the matches with a with a contract, with a, a, a subsidies, etc. So we we have better matches. So thank you very much.